Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome, welcome back to the uh, New Work uh, Seminar. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, for, uh, for me and for Mattia um, as well uh, to be able to introduce this afternoon, Dr. Irene Leonardis, who's uh, a Humboldt Fellow at the University of uh, Potsdam. Um, and uh, uh, who's got wide interest in the uh, intellectual history of uh, of the republican of the republican period. Um, she's uh, published in she published in 2019 a very important book in the Bibliotheca di Ateneum, uh, Varrone unus scilicet antiquorum ominum senso del passato e pratica antiquaria, um, which has I think, readily been recognized as a very distinctive and original uh, contribution, not, not just on Varro, but more generally on uh, uh, late Republican reflections and, and debate on, on, on time, uh, on, on the direction of time and you know, the interplay between, between past and, and future. And uh, indeed much of her work is preoccupied in one way or another with time, uh, uh, including the political implications of reflections and debates uh, on time as they uh, come to us from from a range uh, from a range of uh, uh, from a range of uh, late uh, republican uh, texts varro indeed has been a sort of long standing interest uh, of of hers but she has in fact uh, published on uh, on, on cicero um, and uh, she also has a forthcoming uh, paper on uh, um, the preface uh, to Pliny's Natural History. Um, this evening's paper, this afternoon's uh, paper, indeed takes us also into Lucretian territory, as you as you can see, um, and has a well, yeah, frankly, exciting title: "Translating the Political Clash into Philosophical Debates." A logogamy, logomachy, rather, uh, between uh, Cicero, Lucretius, and Varro? Question mark. Irene, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Federico, already for inviting me. Uh, I also thank Mattia. And uh, uh, this is uh, like a new work. Uh, you have read some part of this. Uh, and but it started somehow with my master thesis, uh, which was uh, dedicated to the um, philosophical issues uh, of uh, the Minipian satires. So in a way it was uh, going back to the past, uh, to my past. Uh, I will present some strong ideas, uh, but uh, it's also a way to, to start a discussion about this uh, use of philosophy uh, in, um, to start or to, to develop more the discussion of the use of philosophy in late antiquity, uh, in late uh, um, Republic. The best knowledge and familiarity of the Roman late Republican elite with Greek philosophy has often been remarked. As capital piece of evidence, Miriam Griffin has pointed to Cicero letters, whose references and puns about philosophy presupposed readers well acquainted with those notions and clearly interested in this subject. The relevance of this philosophical interest for Roman politics might be inferred through the works of Cicero himself and other key politicians such as Bruto or uh, Varro. If Cato the Younger did not write anything on the subject, nevertheless, he embodied uh, in his life and in his death, the figure of the Stoic stage, sage Caesar himself uh, appeared to have had contacts with Epicureanism, as his father-in-law, Piso, was patronizing uh, the Epicurean philosopher um, Philodemus of Gadara and uh, even hosting a significant library. James Stetzel, in a work, uh, in a quite recent work, goes further on this path, assuming that philosophy was not just a practice of the elite's uh, otium, so in the countryside and uh, in their closed uh, villas, but it might have been matter of discussion uh, in the streets of Rome, as we may gather always from Cicero letters, as well as uh, from uh, Varro's satires and uh, Horace ones. Uh, Cristina Rosillo Lopez analyzed how these very satires engaging in a political debate contributed in creating and uh, circulating public opinion. 
Whether we agree on or not with this thesis, it seems plausible that the spreading practice of philosophy in late Republic had, or at least was conceived as having political and civic implications and possibly even concrete goals. Of course, this practice could have just consisted in an intellectual pose. Uh, this romance assumed to be apprised uh, uh, as authoritative, authoritative and to win in the race for power and public office. Uh, a race typical of this age, according to Sallust. Alternatively, they might have been truly persuaded uh, to be able to provide a solution to the problems Roman politics and society were facing. What seems unquestionable is that the practice of philosophy and of politics intertwined, and thus we must consider them together. Purpose of this seminar will be to further investigate this interaction. I will attempt to deepen especially how the philosophical discussion aimed at building an authoritative discourse, and hence resulted in continuous quarrels over words and their correct meaning or use. In this quest for meaning, Romans look back to Greek sources by quotations, allusions, and even direct translations. As a case study for uh, this general tendency, I will focus on verifying the existence of a specific logomachy over the word immanis, monstrous, as well as huge. And what part this word and this logomachy might have played in the public debate in the years of Caesar political rise. The evidence I will provide suggests that this quarrel featured Caesar, Varro, both politically engaged, as well as the obscure figure of uh, the poet Lucretius. The uh, term uh, logomachia, we intend a quarrel over the words uh, were borum cartamen, as the Thesaurus Lingua Latina explained it. The term was probably invented by Varro, as in Greek text, uh, it appears only late uh, in 4th century CE and sporadically. Varro adopted it uh, as a title for one of his many pian satires that dealt uh, with the struggle among Epicureans and Stoics over the summum bonum which is the highest good uh, in which in words per, uh, pursuit must consist the goal of human life. According to the only report uh, over its content uh, we have, Varro here affirmed the existence of a battle of words among these two philosophical schools. Uh, there is a, a lacuna in the text, uh, you, you can read also a translation. However, uh, the, the integration of uh, Edward Norder, as well as the one from um, uh, Jean-Pierre Saad, both suggest that in the satire, it was the way in which things were uh, named to give rise to the disputes between the philosophers. Accordingly, from Varro's point of view, uh, the beliefs of Stoics and Epicureans in some cases were not at all incomp incompatible. Nevertheless, there were continuous disagreements about them, among them on the vocabulary employed. In the satire, the quarrel must have had a comical and witty representation, depending on the meaning of the word edone, goal of the Epicurean philosophy, that was often misunderstood and uh, or distorted as pure animal pleasure, uh, voluptas in Latin. Cassius, uh, in a letter to Cicero written in January 45 BCE, after so his conversion to Epicureanism, provides a defense to uh, these critiques uh, to Epicurean uh, um, by explaining that pleasure cannot be achieved without virtue. In this context, he recalls Caius, which is object of the of the of the. Um, of what we read in, um, in Porphyron's uh, news uh, about the satire. Cacius uh, and also um, Amafinius' works in Latin um, are recalled by Cacius. And Cacius seems to confirm that the common misunderstanding of the Epicurean concept of ne in Rome depended on a lexical problem, uh, or better to say, on uh, the unsatisfying translations from Epicurus. 
the dispute contained or mocked in Varro's Logomachia appeared to be still part, so, of the political discussion in 45 BC, or at least still found echoes in that period. Here, Cassius not only stresses that no Edone exists without the abuse, but he also accused Cicero to improperly call pleasure lovers those, so Philodonoi, those who are purely good lovers and justice lovers. And as such, practice also the other virtues. The battle of words was also a strive over the best translated Greek, as we may understand from this evidence. Indeed, uh, although Catus uh, of Insuber who died uh, in uh, 45 BCE, Amafinius and a certain Rabirius provided the earliest translation of Greek philosophy into Latin language, they were derided by Cicero <coughs> and totally neglected by Lucretius. As well known, both claimed the primacy in uh, spreading Greek philosophy in Rome. Luciano Canfora has speculated that Cicero silence on the account of Lucretius depending uh, precisely on the clash over this primacy. The issue of translation was central in Roman intellectual discussion, so, and also in these uh, philosophical quarrels. Let us now consider the only fragment of the satire Logomachia. Mm -hmm. It is just a verse uh, probably by Nonius Marcellus. I will go a little faster just to uh, provide some uh, more evidence about the satire. Uh, here probably uh, the subject ek, uh, has been identified with fuses, so nature or necessity, kreia. So um, it is probable that here um, maybe an Epicurean was speaking and uh, it was stressed the value of natural necessity for human progress. Also, the Stoics identify in this principle the cause of natural progress. Uh, as such, this fragment will perfectly exemplify the emptiness of the logomachia between the two philosophical schools. I wonder whether um, these quarrels and other quarrels, uh, philosophical quarrels, um, depended and consisted on the use and reuse of the same vocabulary among the different schools. The comedy specifically of the satire, would have thus consisted in, uh, or have been at least stressed, by the paradox of a debate where the contendants are employing the same words, supporting the same ideas, and despite all, could not find an agreement. Uh, to substantiate uh, this suggestion, I would like to draw attention uh, to two rare words contained in the fragments. Uh, one is uh, lanigere, uh, and the other is omullus. Um, Lanigre, uh, it's present also in Lucretius, uh, it was quite rare. Um, we don't know exactly who wrote uh, first, whether Barrow or uh, Lucretius, um, because uh, the Menipia that generally have been dated between the, um, the late 80s and uh, at least 70 C, uh, 77 BC. Uh, now, more and more, uh, the question of uh, their date has been um, reopened and debated, so we don't know exactly who first used this uh, uh, this uh, word, uh, lanigare, which is um, an, uh, an adjective associated, so it's quite rare. But I will uh, focus more on the word omulus. This word, uh, um, it's interesting because it might echo a debate, and specifically a political debate uh, uh, that was contemporary uh, to these works. Indeed, uh, um, in all uh, the fragments of Varro's uh, satires, uh, this uh, diminutive underlines the limits of human nature as opposed to the nature of gods, a sort of piety uh, towards humans. The same adjective appears also in Lucretius' diatribe against the fear of death, so in the book three. Here the poet is using the diatribal style of seeing of cynic stoic philosophy to prove the inconsistency of this fear. As such, he creates a fictional uh, interlocutor who asserts the brevity of life and the need 
to enjoy oneself while one can. But these remarks seems to be a parody of a, a serious co uh, common idea of the brevity of life. Especially the employ of the diminutive omulus has been read as an intentional exaggeration, indicative perhaps of the drunken state of the speaker. Kenny, in his commentary, uh, notices that uh, the situation is piquant. The real Epicurean arraigns the false. Indeed, uh, Lucretius uh, might be giving an, an ironic answer to the over trivialized representation and practice of Epicurean philosophy in Rome. He creates a speaker that justifies his own gluttony and drunkness by recalling the brevity of life. Lastly, it might be worth it to note that Lucretius' passage um, as, as main argument uh, against the death, its equivalency to sleep, from which, from the sleep, no one can awake and in which nothing is experienced. Something similar we find in another satire from Barrow, the Sexagesis, where he imagined a person, maybe even uh, himself, awakening from a 50 year long sleep as the mythic uh, philosopher Epimenides from Crete. The presence of the same word Omulus uh, in this context may suggest again a dialogue, a logomachy with Lucretius. But the political use of the word Omulus is evident in Cicero that uses it uh, against Piso the Epicurean. We remember that Piso was the son-in-law um, uh, was father-in-law Caesar, and um, it is interesting is painted as trying to attract uh, Caesar uh, to Epicureanism, but Caesar is also uh, described uh, as having a greatness and a thirst for fame too high to be bothered by such a humble and so to say land-based figure, this Omulus Piso. We cannot really guess so uh, what was the content of the satire um, uh, Barrow wrote, this logomachia. However, that these sparse traces of intertextuality and lexical interactions between the free intellectuals deserve already attention and could guide us in decoding one last piece of evidence uh, about the, uh, the satire itself, which is contained, uh, um, which is linked to Porphyrion's report. Indeed, this report stems from uh, the commentary um, on uh, Oras for Satire from the second book. Here, the Augustan poet is mocking a certain fictional Epicurean Catius, always Catius, that is lecturing on the rules of refined dinners. According to result uh, gathered by Kirk Freudenberg, whom I quote, there is good reason to, to suspect that Barrow stand, stands behind certain of the verbal flights of fancy in book two, especially this one of Catius. This German Epicurean goes so far as to define a monstrous sin to spend 3,000 on the fish market and then to crown those sprawling fishes in a narrow dish. As I will try to elaborate the expression in Mane Witsium, which Paolo Fedeli tags as almost apocalyptical in his tone, might recall Rucretius poem. Elements of the Rucretian parody have been already remarked in the satire, so it can be plausible that also this expression uh, mocked uh, Lucretius by Referring its language, we will see that it will speak about the uh, Imane Crimen, not an Imane Witsium. Directly referring to Lucretius or through the intermediation of Varro, Horace might provide evidence for the existence of a logomachy, not on uh, the concept of uh, Edone, but on the concept of uh, Imanis at the end of the Republic and uh, its meaning and political use. As premise to the exam of Lucretius' application of the word in manis to his philosophical discourse, uh, I need first to remind the political use attested in the works of uh, Cicero, at least from the 70s BC. Within uh, his rhetoric of terror or rhetoric of fear, as it has been recently defined, 
Cicero employs this term since uh, his speeches against Verus to identify figures who, according to him, threaten the order and the civil life of Rome. As highlighted in uh, Ingo Gildena Capital book, uh, um, insults taken from the animal sphere, so this immane, Im, um, immane sphere, but also others from uh, the sphere of natural disasters, such as pestis, um, suggested the need to remove uh, such individuals uh, uh, devoid of civilization, humanitas, and to, in order to restore the Pax Deorum and to prevent a lapse into prehistoric chaos. In particular, the accusation of humanitas addressed to the most famous opponents, so Varus, Catiline, Antony, served to dehumanize them and to represent them as possible tyrants. Becoming almost a slogan defining everything that could wreck havoc in Rome, Imanis is also applied in 55 BC to the Epicurean Piso, who is not just an omulus, but is Imanimus, Imanissimum, Aquedissimum Mostrum, and uh, his conduct is characterized by Imanitas. It is worth notice that uh, uh, the noun in Manitas is not attested before Cicero himself, so he could have uh, invented it. Uh, moreover, uh, we notice that in this very speech, uh, Cicero is exploiting the trivialized image of the Roman Epicurean, uh, uh, Epicureanism by calling uh, Piso himself uh, Epicurus Noster uh, and uh, insulting him uh, as being educated in a pixie rather than in a school. This huge usage of the word imanis must have been well acknowledged in Roman public opinion. And uh, at least uh, if we consider the insistence since the, the earliest uh, speeches uh, against Varus on the characterization of the imanitas as a threat to the existence and the endurance of the Respublica. However, it is just in 55 BCE that Cicero used it against an Epicurean was philosophical choice is exploited uh, as an insult. Such Lucretius, the Epicurean Lucretius uh, as well, could have not missed this specific facet of Cicero rhetoric. Since in these years, he was composing his poem, or at least part of it. The only reference we have uh, about the composition of uh, Poem we all know is uh, dates back to February 54 BC um, when uh, Cicero alludes to it in, his, in the famous letter to his brother Quintus. Whether the poem in its entirety dated to the years of, of the civil war between Caesar and Pompey, so 49 48 BC, as it has recently proposed, or it was completed in the late 50s, as it is traditionally accepted. Lucretius, in his use of Imanis, must have been well aware of Cicero rhetoric built around this word. From this point, I, believe, I move now to examine the notion of Imanis uh, that emerges from uh, the Derevum Natura. Uh, the poem, uh, the adjective is used uh, nine times to describe, uh, to describe an immensity capable of arousing dismay and fear. Ipanis describes both a monstrous size in a generic sense and that typical of the uh, giants. Although these uh, use uh, uh, perfectly fit the common meaning of Imanis in Roman language and culture, as it has been uh, explored by Maurizio Bettini, Lucretius, in two cases, seems to join this word to the idea of death. Uh, three cases. Uh, as an eternal oblivion, we will see uh, this concept, death as oblivion. And uh, he, he, he seems to do this in order to remove the fear of the end. We know that Epicureans dedicated considerable effort uh, on, on this uh, point of uh, on the removal of the fear of the gods and the fear of the death, uh, both identified as um, main source of common mental disturbance. 
humans uh, specifically should not be frightened uh, by the death, by the idea of the death, as the soul is mortal. This association with death uh, first appears in book three. Here, the, poets, uh, the poet devotes a long section to the demonstration of the mortality of the soul before turning to attack the senseless fear of the end. Lucretius mentions uh, the terrible disease, mar uh, makers of death, uh, um, Fabricator Leti. Um, and he defined them in Manes. Uh, these uh, diseases affect the soul as well as the body, both considered mortal. By means of this description, it begins to introduce the relationship between immanitas and death, specifically defined with the term letum, and thus characterized by the idea of oblivion. In the fifth book, this link between immanitas and letum is evoked again, even more directly, through the image of the door of death, Yanualeti, that waits with its mouth agape to swallow everything and everyone. The immense opening of this door is like a cask defined in Manis, not only for its size, but because it arouses terror, like the jaws of an enormous monster. Aware that the idea of death frighten, frightens and intimidates Lucretius through the use of Immanis, on the one hand, wants to portray the power of this collective fear. On the other, on the other hand, it seems to reject the traditional religious response to the anxieties about the end. This response generally consists in charging Romans' belief in an eternal existence. Indeed, in Roman religion, the dead were deities called the Imanes, literally the good gods. As Bettini explains once again, the fear of the dead, which is typical of many ancient civilizations, would have been overcome by this euphemistic definition, which aimed at making them mild and inoffensive. In this sense, Lucretius words appear deliberately irreverent and destabilizing. Put together in Matasolatum, the poet uh, seems to suggest that, the, that it is not possible to tame the idea of death through the belief in gods in afterlife or in prizes for the souls of the worthy dead. Death remains in manis, and as such should not be feared but accepted by mankind. To overcome this visceral fear, the only solution suggested by Lucretius is outside the traditional religion. It consists in the soothing acceptance of the laws of nature and therefore of the dis disintegration of matter itself. According to one famous Lucretian simile, instead of acting like children that fear in the dark until the light of the sun frees them from this anxiety of the unknown, human beings must embrace the Epicurean philosophy and so accept the idea of the end without fearing it, as if it were a frightening and immanis monster. The image of the Yanualiti occurs in the section of the book five in which the nature of our world is, and its mortality is discussed. Having been born, it must end, metaphorically devoured by the mouth of, of death. Alessandro Schiavaro recently explored the similarities between Lucretius' apocalyptic imagery and message and those of Hellenistic Judaism, positing the existence of an Hellenistic zeitgeist pervading Etruscan, Roman, and Jewish culture. Lucretian inspiration indeed appears to depend on and to be fully embedded in this zeitgeist. Nevertheless, one will still wonder why, in the very years when Cicero in the Senate and in the courts was frightening the end of Rome by exploiting apocalyptic metaphors and vocabulary, Lucretius deployed the very same words to popularize Epicurean philosophy and to convince his Roman readers, and especially his patron Manius, candidate for the consulate in 54 BCE, that everything must end, despite one fear toward this very idea.
Whether this linguistic choice was conscious or not, it seems unquestionable that Lucretius' discourse deconstructed and, so to say, blasted from the inside Cicero rhetoric. Was strength lay exactly in its conceptual creativity that can be defined as philosophical. And here I put again uh, Gildenau's uh, groundbreaking study about Cicero's uh, creative eloquence. As such, the use and abuse of Cicero vocabulary of the humanitas, even if it was not conceived intentionally as a logomachy by Lucretius, resulted nevertheless in a battle of words. Thesis, we can now move to consider um, another famous passage belonging to the fifth book of uh, the De Rerum Natura, in which the term immanis appears in an evident polemical context. Here Lucretius recalled the myth of the, of the gigantomachy to attack traditional religions as well as those philosophies that postulate the eternity of the cosmos. In this inverse gigantomachy, as Monica Gale called it, Lucretius employed the adjective immanis to define the alleged crime committed by Epicureans, who, in the wake of their masters, attacked the traditional religion with the purpose of removing the Olympic deities. By this, I quote again Gale's works, uh, Lucretius reversed the traditional moral drawn from the myth throughout antiquity. Rather than representing a humorist, uh, disorder and barbarity, the giants have become heroic figures, challenging and overthrowing the tyranny of religio. Both in the academic and peripatetic traditions, the world is maintained to be immortal and unending. Materialism, by postulating uh, the destruction of the matter, is criticized by, uh, both by, in Plato and uh, Aristotle and is criticized as something monstrous and dreadful, deinos. Alluding to this context, Lucretius renders the Greek deinos by immanis. A sophisticated audience, this translation would have sounded even more transgressive than the gigantomic itself, because deinos, fearful, terrible, is connected to the word deus, which means fear and has a double-edged meaning, signifying also uh, something marvelously strong, powerful. Such imanis, uh, imanis de nos, is likely used to underline the feeling of fear that moves the accusation of impiety, but at the same time opens the way to a positive concept something so powerful that cannot be beaten. I will try to go a little faster now to where I was. So to this titanic and desecrating attack, Cicero seems to have responded soon. Uh, we know that he was reading at least part of the, of the poem uh, from Lucretius in February 54. First reaction can be noticed in the De Repubblica. As it has been remarked again by Schiazzaro, this, uh, this work includes a view of the cosmos, human evolution, history, and politics completely alternative to those of the De Rerum Natura. Cicero Iacens stressed and developed the concept of Immanis as a danger and a threat to the Commonwealth and the peace of Rome. It is Imanis is applied to Romans excessively warlike conduct before Numa's civilized religious reforms, to the absolute governments of the tyrants and of the masses, as well as to Carnea's speech at the time of the famous philosophical delegation in 155 BCE, whose participants were soon expelled from Rome. Hypothesis that there was a quarrel between Cicero and Lucius around the word Immanis might be supported by a letter of Cicero to his brother dating to the summer of 54 BC. 
which is after the beginning of the composition of the, the Republica, probably started in May of the very year. In this letter, Cicero might have been commented with sarcasm on the rumors made public later in September of the scandal of the lecture fraud in the consulate Gaius Memmius, patron and, de and dedicatee of the poem of Lucretius. Clearly, the use of uh, Imanis could uh, simply indicate here the enormity of the phenomenon of corruption that is circulating again in Rome. Nevertheless, it is tempting to detect in these words also a subtle allusion, allusion to Lucretius' polemical reuse of the word of the term Imanis. Following this hypothesis advanced um, on the existence of a late Republican Logomachis, we may assume that the clash of ideas between Caesar and Lucretius probably passed through the use and reuse of keywords such as Immanis. Such Caesar here might be somehow anticipating and almost looking forward the fate of Manius at the election despite his deploying of such a huge uh, ambitus, as well as the failure of the Epicurean giants and the ideal professed by their philosophy. In the Republica, uh, in the De Republica, uh, we find maybe some other um, ins at Lucretius, and we can consider specifically a fragment from uh, some new Scipionis, um, here, Cicero um, in the De Republica not only imagined, as, as we all know, the salvation and the eternity salus of the Roman world, but also asserted the survival in the afterlife, in the heavenly places, of extraordinary humans on account of their merits for the country and for all humankind. Among these outstanding figures, he places Scipio Emilianus and uh, Hercules. In this stance, significantly, significantly, Cicero quotes the verses of Ennius on the, door, on, on the door of heavens and on the apotheosis of Scipio, by which Lucretius seems to have been inspired by his polemical representation of the door of death, the Januale that we have seen. We can notice that it, uh, it's uh, there. Uh, there. So there is a door for worthy men. This door allows them to enter the sky and to survive death, not only through the memory, but also by a form of deification. Again, we may sense here how Cicero was openly opposing Lucretius' message and specifically his praise of Epicurus. Indeed, this letter, according to Lucretius, would have reached a semi-divine status and would have outclassed even Hercules in saving humanity. Then, in the metaphorical clash between the Imanis giant and forces defending Olympus, Lucretius took the side of the villains and of Epicurus. On the opposite front, the ex-consul Cicero presented himself as a defender of Rome's religions and political traditions. Next to Hercules, the civilizing hero, par excellence of Stoicism and traditional Roman morality. But to the philosophical dialogues uh, written between uh, 45 and 44 BC, all dedicated to the Stoic Marco Junius Brutus, nephew and son-in-law of, of Cato Diuticensis. Here Cicero, as we all know, never mentioned Lucretius. However, um, with his very writings, he provides, as I believe, an answer to the reinterpretation of the manis made in the, the Rerum Natura. Specifically, he used this word always in a stoic traditionalist context and or uh, against the Epicurean characters. By a strategic repetition, he transformed it, he transformed in manis in a sort of watchword marking the opposition to Epicureanism as well as to the, attempt, uh, to the attempted tyrants from the past, as we have seen from uh, the speeches against Varus and Catiline, but also um, 
the present attempted tyrants, so Caesar and Antony. Uh, going a little faster, um, we may see that in the Definibus, uh, Imanis is found only once in the third book and is uttered precisely by Cato, who committed suicide the previous year during the clash, of course, against Caesar. The story of Republican champion illustrating the principle of associated life observes that only some types of Imanis solitary beasts do not conform to them. Then he contends that social bounds and philanthropy are natural characteristics of humans. The historical context that frames the composition of this, frame, of this passage, as well as the specific contents of, uh, of these words, refers to a double meaning of, of humanitas, both philosophical and political. In the words of Cato, one cannot really miss a reference to the suicide of the historical figure, as well as an allusion to the Laos Catonis composed by Cicero in April 46 and published at the end of the year. We must also remember that in the same summer of 45, when uh, Cicero was composing the philosophical dialogue, Caesar was writing his Anticato. Excluded then that through the image of the Imanes, speaking this, and so through the image of the Imanes uh, beast, uh, Cicero may be alluding also to the dictator. Since after Caesar's death, the accusation of Imanitas will be addressed almost explicitly to him as a tyrant in the Deo Fisis in the Deo Ficis. To Scolani Disputationes, we can find a similar use of Imanis. Uh, here, uh, Imanis is used several times as the dialogue is specifically um, the most closest to the strict stoicism. And um, it appears uh, in particular Imanis in the book on the immortality of the soul where it is firmly argued that no man is so wild, so immanis, that he has no clue in his mind of the beliefs in the gods. The use of immanis seems therefore part of the Roman Stoic traditionalist discourse, hostile to Epicureanism and to its spreading in Rome. Another and, more, and even more clear piece of evidence in this sense in the dialogue is uh, in the dialogue the de, de Natura Deorum, where only the opponents of uh, the Epicurean values use Imanis. It is not a new hypothesis that target of Caesar discussion was Lucretius himself. This can clay, as rightly noted in, a, in the speech of the Stoic Balbus, uh, a reply to the Lucretian theory of the mortality of the world. In support uh, of uh, this interpretation, one uh, can note uh, in Balcom's words, the reference to the Imanitas. Uh, this is the passage. Um, repeated three times, according to the Stoic use that associates Imanis with ferocious animals opposed to and to humankind by nature, as they lack soci uh, sociability. But an even more direct response to Lucretian Immanitas and uh, its Epicurean uh, gigantomachy is expressed uh, in the reply of the pontiff uh, uh, Cotta to Valeus in the first book. Uh, here, Cicero, identifying himself with the idea supported by Cotta, links atheism to humanitas. We find again here the vocabulary of philosophical conflicts, including expression also used by Lucretius, agredia. The pontiff doubts the rational force, ratio, a word on which uh, Lucretius insists twice. So uh, the pontiff doubts the ratio of the Epicurean demonstration on the nature of the divinities and observes that there are so many people of such savage barbarism, immanitas, that they have no suspicions of gods. 
Many arguments can uh, disturb, uh, conturbent, and confuse humans, leading them not to believe in the existence of the gods. But humans cannot be affected by the Epicureans. This is what Cicero seems to suggest by alluding to the verb used also in the Gigantomachy by Lucretius. Uh, the verb, but uh, the same verb, but with the opposite uh, prefix. So not, uh, not disturbo, but conturbo. In the same discussion against Valeus, the pontiff denies any value, uh, any value to the atomistic and vacuum theory. And finally states the unlikelihood of uh, Epicurean theories. The oracles of the scholars of nature are more valid. In the expression nunc physicorum oracla fundo, used by Cotta, we might detect another direct reference to the verses of Lucretius belonging to the uh, Gigantomachy. Uh, skip the deo thesis, just because I'm a little late, uh, but uh, we see there e expressed clearly um, the, the accusation of the humanitas uh, of people like Caesar. Caesar is not mentioned, but uh, also the, comment uh, the commentators has noticed, have noticed clearly the reference to Caesar. And uh, it is interesting that the thesis uh, uh, ends with, um, with another attack to the Epicureans. I will just move uh, quickly to Varro and then go to the end. Um, also, Varro seemed to echo this quarrel uh, about the humanitas. And um, it, is, uh, it is clear, uh, it is more clear uh, the study of uh, the word humanis in Lucretius and uh, Cicero, but in Varro it's more complicated due to the uh, fragmentary state of, work, of his works. However, the seven uh, uses of Imanis uh, seems to suggest uh, that Varro uh, is always uh, aware, in, aware of um, what uh, the desecrating use of Lucretius of Imanis and uh, sort of responded to him, uh, albeit without uh, um, the fighting attitude typical of Cicero. Um, there are many uh, possibilities to find hints at Lucretius and Cicero use of Imanis and the Manipians, uh, specifically uh, for the references uh, to the apotheosis of Hercules, but also uh, to uh, some, um, some uh, expressions that recall Lucretius poem, uh, for example, uh, Punto Temporis. Um, but uh, um, I will not consider this just for reason of time. I will go the meaning of Imanitas uh, in, uh, in the antiquarian works of Varro. As I am investigating in some of my recent publications, Varro conceived the, the Imanitas as opposed to Humanitas, like Cicero, but by re uh, reinterpreting it, as uh, by reinterpreting humanitas as human tradition, human memory. Imanis thus indicates what, because of its usefulness, is beyond the human knowledge. The incommensurability of humanitas applies to time, and especially to prehistoric times. As well known, according to Varro's definition, this period is not part of the historical or mythical tradition. And it, does, uh, and it is thus called Adelos. This idea was perhaps exposed uh, in the De Gente Populi Romani, a uh, work that uh, dates back to, the, uh, to 43 BC or shortly after. But there is a trace of it uh, in the opening parts of the second and third book of the Res Rustica, which I put here. Here, Varro deals with human development and observes uh, in the second book, that the history of mankind is eternal from the time we have memory. So from the very beginning of human memory. Thus taking a, uh, an opposite position to that of Lucretius. Uh, Lucretius indeed, uh, uh, to demonstrate the mortality of our soul uh, and uh, uh, the youth of our, uh, of our uh, history. Uh, 
recalling that the accounts uh, uh, of a prehistoric, uh, the, moral, uh, um, the most uh, ancient account uh, um, don't date back uh, to events prior to the Trojan War. So we see a, a total um, opposite position between uh, um, Varro and Lucretius on this point. Um, it is probable that Varro, uh, in this uh, demonstration, this idea of uh, the Immanitas was inspired by a passage of Plato's Law, especially uh, Book 7. Uh, uh, from this text, it seems to derive the idea of the immortality of humankind and thus of the world. This immortality is based on the idea of uh, the incommensurability of time defined by it as amekanos. In this brief passage, uh, uh, the Athenian of the dialogue picks, picks up and completes the discussion of the origin and the development of the states discussed in the first line of Book 3 which is quoted here. Um, uh, after noting that cities have existed since time immemorial, the Athenian considers the myth of the universal flood as a trace of an event that really happened and observes that after every great destruction, Sora, everything, even memory, is erased. And the history of civilization begins again. Echoing these Platonic passages, Varro, in the introduction of the third book of the Rest Rustica, um, translates Amekanos with Immanis, Numerus Anorum. Such, he admits the impossibility of knowing the remotest times of humanity and the world as this is part of uh, the scene of the of obscure time, Adelos. Like Cicero, Varro have written a, mon a monumental work on the traditions of Rome, was aware of the danger of some philosophical ideas, but avoided a discussion in the direct political terms. He prefers to disarm the threat of the humanitas by relegating it to the realm of, unknown, of the unknown. At the same time, having confidence in the immortality of the human race and its memory reaffirms the need to preserve this uh, Rome uh, and the traditions of Rome in the memory of the good citizen, the Boni. In this sense, both Cicero and Varro defended the traditions and the stability of Rome and its eternity from a philosophical political point of view the former from a gnosological and cultural perspective, the latter. However, I believe that the discourse of Varro was deliberately marked by ambiguity, which consists in avoiding an explicit demonization of immanitas. By proposing a new meaning of immanis, again through the translation of Greek Varro distinguished himself from Cicero, so to keep the philosophical cultural discourse as apparently devoid of nuances and political motivations. In addition, he managed to enter the debate between Cicero and Lucretius and to assume a role super partes, never openly hostile to Epicureanism and especially never hostile to Caesar. We must remember that in those years, Varro dedicated to Caesar as Pontifex Maximus the section of the Res Divinae of the Antiquitates. Moreover, after fighting in Spain on the side of Pompey in 49 BC, he was defeated, but immediately forgiven by Caesar. Such, he appointed him as the head of the, uh, in 46 BC, he appointed him as the head of this project for the creation of the first public library in Rome. I have a last Conclusion, I hope that I'm not too late, uh, but stop me if I am. Mm, to sum up and to briefly provide some last suggestion in support of a political reading of the word in Manis and a political reading of the, of the Dererum Natura, I would like to turn now to the ending of the poem. The most famous episode of the plague in Athens closes with a brawl over the dead bodies. This image of the people fighting 
Cartantes and then Rixantes, forbearing, forbearing their relatives, acquired a deeper meaning if we think about the philosophical brawl that was going on at the end of the Republic over the, reach, over the issue of death. This image of an absurd fight, my stage at the at a sort of a meta reading, a philosophical clash, alluding to those who, such Cicero, attempted to provide an afterlife to the dead. Indeed, uh, in, the, in another satire from Varro, that has also as at the center a logomachy, uh, which is called Armorum Iudicum, Varro employed the same verb, rixare, to depict, ironically, the paradoxical violence of the philosophers and or their, their followers. Another question comes from Lucretius' representation of the best, Optimus Quisque, being infected and thus dying in the attempt to save those contaminated bodies. It is difficult to imagine that the poet forgot that Cicero in 50 C BCE, in his speech Processio, had defined the optimates as those politicians discussing with and approved by the best man in Rome, Optimus Quisque. The very syntagm occurs just once in the De Rerum Natura, exactly in this closing episode, where the Epicurean poet stresses not only the uselessness of the struggle over the dead, but also the invincible power of Latum, the death without memory, the oblivion. The political echoes of this statement they may be easily grasped if we consider what the Stoic Balbus in Cicero's De, De Natura Deorum says exactly about the best man, again, of more willing to encounter danger for their country's sake. Indeed, they do not die because they acquire in their states an eternal memory as if they were gods. Consciously or unconsciously, Lucretius blasted from the inside Cicero rhetoric and political discourse on the eternal Respublica, suggesting through this aspect a useless fight over the dying body of the Republic, at least the Republic as it has been conceived by Cicero and his optimates. Thank you. Thanks very much, Irene. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, plenty to talk about, um, plenty of material, plenty, um, plenty of arguments. Um, I'm opening the floor for questions and comments. Why I apologize because I have to fasten a little to go no, a little no, no, fast no. at the end, but uh, otherwise we would have missed the conclusion. <laughs> I suppose I can I can start with a with a I suppose rather rather general question really. Um, do you think that the um, semantic battles over over imanis are also led by a degree of anxiety over imperial expansion. So yeah, basically, you know, perhaps the empire is really getting too large. Yeah, possibly. Um, what I, I think more is that um, some statesmen are getting too large, let's say their role in, uh, the, polit in the politics is getting too uh, too big is is becoming too big, and um, but of course uh, um, the problem of the enlarging uh, borders of Rome uh, is always connected with this idea of anxiety toward the end, toward um, something that is changing, and um, uh, clearly um, uh, what I, I wanted to say is also that. Um, I still what is big uh, it's negative per se uh, it's a conservative way of uh, uh, protecting the borders and protecting what was the status quo in Rome uh, while uh, opening to other interpretation of what is huge uh, uh, 
uh, as such uh, also opens the mentality to new to new words in a way to a new world uh, yeah yeah thank you very much other questions well i mean if I may then sort of following up without wanting to really monopolize the conversation that um, I think the case you've constructed on Imanis is pretty is pretty strong and and uh, really can be can be traced quite uh, um, quite clearly in the text that you've been talking about. Um, are you thinking about excuse the uh, unintentional pun extending the investigation to uh, other words that uh, uh, denote size? Vastus, vasticas. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, in um, we can uh, go back also to the to the slides, so it's it's easier. I will share again my screen. So also, ingens, uh, it's part of, uh, but it is less uh, uh, connotated uh, uh, politically. But if we go back to uh, Oral's uh, uh, testimony, uh, okay, here I didn't quote everything, but we can see that. The two um, uh, phrases that sort of uh, may echo uh, Lucretius are not only the immane witium, but also the flagitium ingens. Uh, ingens is less connotated uh, politically, both in Cicero and also in uh, Lucretius, that uses it uh, much more than uh, immane. Um, as such, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, I mean, my study now is not uh, really on uh, the idea of vastity or usefulness, but more on uh, this use and reuse of uh, the same vocabulary. Uh, so I'm not I will not focus on, on a study of uh, Ingens per se. Uh, as I said, I, I decided to focus on Imanis because uh, Imanis, where are you? I lost you. Stop here. <laughs> Where are you? Because Imanis uh, um, was uh, exploited, uh, uh, really uh, uh, almost, um, how to say, uh, squeezed uh, in all its uh, implication by by Cicero, and um, that's why I think it uh, aroused uh, a sort of reaction, and uh, um, and uh, yeah. the, the use of Lucretius can be considered for this. Thank you. Questions? Too much material. <laughs> There's certainly plenty of material. Well, I mean, I've got one while people collect their thoughts. Um, towards the end, you, oh, Tim, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll get you. No, please, Tim, over to you. I'll, I can ask mine later. Tim and Amy. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm really sorry. I uh, missed the first part of your paper, which sounded so interesting. I'm afraid I was stuck on a train. Um, but uh, you've probably dealt with this already. But can you say something about the etymology of Imanis and uh, how this might connect to? Yeah. So I didn't um, speak too much about the etymology because there is an article that I quoted twice. Uh, uh, from uh, 1978, I think, written by Maurizio Bettini, who investigated the, the meaning of manis as uh, something bonus uh, originally, and uh, the manis uh, um, were uh, exactly the not uh, good. And the, um, this etymology um, lies on the idea that what is um, too big, uh, it's uh, considered uh, um, something that uh, somehow, how to say, um, is uh, scaring. Uh, so um, I, I didn't um, focus on that because there is already uh, some biography and material. And um, I just, uh, what I did knew was to uh, notice how Lucretius by putting together death and uh, Imanis in a way is sort of protesting against, against uh, the idea of the day manis, the good uh, gods that were the, the dead ones. So 
uh, I think that there is, uh, I mean, Lucretius uh, etymologies and plays with words have been uh, a little studied, so I, I'm not surprised if he's playing uh, about this. Right, I mean, but the, the, the prefix, I mean, implies, doesn't it, a pejorative meaning from the very word go, and Lucretius is evidently playing with that. Don't you think? Uh, in, um, is, uh... Well, in uh, is uh, like a, 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 the alpha privativa, it's something uh, that negates uh, yeah, the exactly. elements. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's saying that it's not good, but uh, what is not good? And um, also the fact that it is alluding to this, um, uh, to Plato and Aristotle uh, um, sources uh, where, uh, and translating uh, Deinos as uh, Imanis, uh, it's an interesting playing uh, on this. Uh, mm. So I don't know if I missed the the the, the, the no, question and uh, if I answer bad. Uh, thank <laughs> no, you. No, thank you question. very much. That's extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. I mean, so you, you've got this this incredibly you know detailed uh, case study, which you know was so rich. Uh, uh, with evidence. And uh, so, you know, sort of slightly paradoxically, I, I, I wonder if I could ask you to speculate a bit um, about, you know, what's happening beyond this. We happen to have this wonderful example of a particular time and place where there are these incredibly detailed debates going on and we can read them, you know, we can, we can, we can read large, large portions of this. But do you have uh, any hunches about other examples uh, where we have this idea of these, you know, words being so incredibly politicized in this way, um, because it, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, I mean, I, I can think of examples from from today, but having sort of, you know, pro proven the principle that this happens in the ancient world, where else do you see it? So uh, this is part of my new project. Uh, um, I'm studying the the late Republic uh, discourse uh, and. Um, how in the language of the late Republic, there is a, a sort of mirror of the crisis of language. So as in our times, uh, in a moment of uh, distress, of political distress, uh, um, the lack of a um, consensus and also the lack of capability to find an agreement among the political elites, uh, in a way is mirrored by their incapacity to find a common language or worse, uh, uh, their incapacity to communicate uh, while using the same words or the same language. So this is my my project. I'm I'm not sure that uh, it was as such in Rome. Uh, I'm finding some evidence, and um, the idea is now to find also a positive word, uh, not just a negative one, uh, in order to prove the thesis. So the the use and reuse also of positive words. And uh, another part of my study consists on the on the exploration of the use of metaphors as a way to construct a, an, uh, an authoritative, uh, authoritative uh, discourse. Um, in, in the sense, uh, um, I think that uh, um, in a in a moment of crisis of language, uh, those capable to um, be appraised as the most uh, able in uh, using language and uh, defining words and thus defining our times, uh, could aim and uh, could um, uh, want to uh, be apprised as those finding the solutions. And this, in, this, uh, in this perspective, we can understand why they were writing about language, not only Varro, but also Caesar, why he was writing about language. <laughs> he could have had something more interesting to do than uh, writing about language. And also why Lucretius uh, compare the universe and the elements of the universe to the elements of language. In this sense, uh, if the, the words, uh, the, 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 the universe is made of atoms, uh, the, the language is made of letters. And so we can uh, rewrite our world uh, by rewriting our language in a way. <laughs> Thank you very much. More questions? Well, I, I've got a quick question, but for first an, an equally quick comment uh, following on Amy's suggestion. I mean, it seems to me that what you've been doing with Imanis uh, could actually tie in uh, 
quite interesting and in ways that I, I for one need to think harder about with uh, the important argument of Mostein Marx on uh, um, ideological monotony in uh, Republican politics. I mean, you, you seem to actually put out there a rather different view of, of what people did with and two words uh, in at least in, in, in a certain phase or at least in some quarters of, of, of late Republican Rome. Um, uh, maybe to this monotony, there was some reaction. Also, this, is a, this well, can be a thesis. Uh, yes, indeed. Or perhaps one could just argue that actually <laughs> there is ideological monotony in the Contio uh, and rather more interesting developments to intervene uh, you know, on the written page or in the sort yeah. of acro essays in the... Uh, um, I mean, Valentina Reina on Libertas would be uh, another place to look. Yes, indeed. Um, so, yeah, um, the, 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 yeah. Uh, the, the, the question, though, uh, again, talking about Libertas and, and, and political culture, uh, some of us, um, at least modern students of late Republican Rome, are, I think, rather cynical about the uh, value of uh, um, the analytical value of that process your passage on optimates and populares, right? Um, whereas you've actually suggested that on some level, Lucretius might have taken it seriously. I, mean, I wonder whether you can expand a bit more on that uh, yeah. very yeah, yeah, important point you made towards the end. So this was uh, my last, uh, how I called it, uh, my last suggestion as uh, something new. And um, uh, the idea is not that it's, taking it seriously, but in a way is, um, well, I would say, um, it's responding to this uh, serious uh, um, statement from, C uh, from Cicero. I mean, Cicero is stating something ser quite seriously, whether he believed it in not or not, whether these optimatas were uh, something really existent or just an invention. And um, as I said, uh, um, I speak. I spoke about uh, um, Cicero's optimates as he conceived it. Uh, so, um, of course, the problem uh, uh, lies also in the fact that uh, are, are we believing that these sort of uh, logogmakis uh, um, were completely serious or were also a little um, some rhetoric exercises? Because they can uh, they can easily lapse in that sort of a uh, domain. My idea uh, on on the very end that we can watch it again just to uh, be more clear is that uh, if uh, um, Lucretius use uh, uses this very expression just once, just at the end uh, where it is stating. Uh, is describing the end of the dead of many people in Athens. So this uh, symbolical and uh, uh, without uh, Epicureanism and uh, the rationality, the rationality uh, conceived by that philosophy. Well, in a way, um, uh, is playing uh, with uh, with this idea of uh, the optimus quisque, uh, and is stating that there is no eternity for them. Uh, that, the, uh, uh, whatever uh, Caesar was playing or saying uh, in the courts or in the Senate, there was no, no possibility for, uh, uh, for them to overcome uh, uh, the latum. Uh, the death and the oblivion uh, was there waiting for them. Uh, was this serious uh, or was justice, I don't know, supporting uh, the populares or at least uh, uh, the people more near um, Lucretius himself, uh, that must be uh, proved uh, somewhere else. Uh, that for me was for now just a suggestion. And uh, we have time and uh, pages to <laughs> prove something else. <laughs> well, thanks very much indeed. We got a question from Federica and one from Michele. Please, Federica, over to you. I don't know if Federica yeah. can hear us. Probably not. Ah, ah, yeah. oh, now she can, but we can hear her. No. We can hear you, sorry. Oh. 
sorry, we, 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 we just can't hear you. Sorry. Just maybe for once um, a question right. in the chat might be a good idea. Oh no, maybe now we can hear you. Sorry. Nope. Sorry. Okay. Michele, go ahead. Maybe Federica can type her question. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, a very quick question following on uh, what uh, Federico and Demi were saying. And uh, <clears throat> of course, there are um, a lot of words that seems to take a pejorative meaning in the late Republican period. Factio, for example, is another word mm -hmm. uh, of this kind. Even through, we do have signs that uh, Factio actually had, um, could have had, uh, a pejorative meaning also in the late second century uh, BC. And so uh, I was just wondering how much we are bounded by the evidence that we have for just saying that in the late Republic that was happening and that there was this general sense of crisis and decadence. I mean, maybe there was this sense of crisis and decadence also in the uh, earliest period. Um, but also we do not have so much evidence about it. So I just really wanted to, to know what the, do you thought about this? Thank you for the question. Of course, that's a, uh, that's a problem. How can we um, prove that this was not like the common uh, refraining of uh, the mass mayorum or whatever it is? Uh, the crisis is there and maybe it was always there and everyone was always complaining about the, their times. Um, the evidence uh, we have in the first century BC are different, of course, and um, but we know that th there was no other of Lucretius poem, a uh, poem uh, such as the one from Lucretius. That is another uh, already an evidence, and um, the possibility to prove uh, uh, we uh, with no doubt. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's not possible, I mean, to prove it without doubts. But uh, the fact that there is a, a sort of um, a monotony also about this, uh, maybe this is partially evidence. The fact that um, they are all uh, mumbling about this, uh, they are all uh, reflecting about this. Uh, um, of course, uh, we have a text from uh, written from the, uh, by the, the elite, so it's part of society, uh, but they were uh, at the center of this society and uh, of this uh, historical moment. So, uh, as I said, uh, it's not uh, <laughs> as sure uh, evidence, but a uh, piece of evidence, but already it's this monotony, this insistence, this uh, also this uh, building, um, how to say, uh, a language that always passes through this. Uh, um, uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm also studying, uh, I'm, I'm working, I have, just to be precise, I'm working at the Tesaurus for, for some months, uh, and I will be writing on the, uh, on the word uh, ruina. Ruina is specifically uh, a word that, uh, how to say, it's uh, connected to the idea of crisis. And, my project there will, will also be to try to um, find out whether uh, the insistence on the word ruina in Cicero, in Lucretius, in Arrow, from, other, from different per perspectives, but always on the word ruina, if this uh, is already a proof, of a piece of evidence and a proof uh, of the fact that they were attending, uh, they were like uh, waiting for this end, uh, from, for this collapse of the world. Uh, so this is the only, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still there, so I have to study it, but, so, but I will tell you after maybe if something came up, comes up. And we do have a question in the chat, or a question comment from Federica, which I'm just going to read out for those who are not. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, thank you so much for Federica. Oh, well, yes. uh, you want to read it, uh, Federico? Or, yeah. No, I, th I think you can just go ahead, mm -hmm. please. Um, because I had to cut some part of the of this um, paper, and uh, a part was devoted uh, to Cicero speaking the language of Caesar. So, both in the uh, in Pisonem and uh, in the so-called uh, uh, Caesarian orations. Cicero used uh, Imanis uh, in the sense that Federica has written down. So 
uh, refer, uh, refer to the Naziones Barbare. My, my, my idea is that in that moment when uh, Caesar was trying to dialogue, to, to put up a dialogue uh, with Caesar, he was uh, sort of uh, forgetting about his concept of Immanis uh, and using Immanis to, uh, how to say, um, make analogy and to praise uh, uh, Caesar conquests outside Rome. Uh, and uh, we can see, uh, see it clearly in the Impisonem where um, uh, Cicero is using Imanis uh, both uh, against the Epicureans in order to put uh, Caesar, um, I would say, um, far away from Piso and all the Epicureans, uh, but also in a, in a passage, uh, I cannot have it uh, right now, but if you look it up in, uh, in the Impisona, we will, you will see that there is a, a clear passage where um, Cicero is alluding to these Imanes uh, Barbares Gentes, uh, and is doing this in order to wink, uh, let's say, at Caesar. Mm. And to, uh, as I believe there is, uh, is um, as I will, uh, my, my book, this will be part of my monograph, uh, um, is using the language of Caesar because Caesar in the, um, the Bello Gallico uses Immanis only to, to speak about the, the barbary, so uh, about the foreign people. And of course, in this, uh, we can see another interesting point. Uh, um, the fact that uh, while Caesar was uh, finding enemies outside, uh, Cicero used uh, Immanis uh, to uh, attack the enemy inside Rome. And uh, so uh, thank you so much, Federica, for giving him the chance to complete. Uh, I had to delete also this uh, uh, part of the PowerPoint because it was too big. And, um, but um, thank you so much. Excellent. Yes, it's nice when questions uh, enable you to bring back into the fold stuff you had to cut down. Yes, it's, it's a nice feeling. Um, other, other questions or comments? She will type something out. Right. Well, if there aren't other uh, interventions or, or, or sort of remarks, um, I think we should... Oh, Federica, yes, we have a second comment. Indeed, I was wondering. Oh, well, and it's an appreciative one. Um, very convincing that these authors were actually and intentionally quoting each other and replying to each other. And Federica also agrees that it wasn't just a matter of form and rhetoric, but went deeper than that. And uh, yes, uh, she rightly comments that, of course, Irene's uh, argument here is a contribution to the debate on whether Varro and Lucretius were actually quoting each other or just referring to, uh, general, to general ideas. And yes, it seems to me that. Irene has made indeed uh, a number of uh, uh, important uh, points uh, on that uh, on that count. Um, yes, yes. There's also a, one final comment from Federica in the chat. Yeah, on, yeah. Uh, I didn't quote this because already um, there have been uh, some publication of this. Uh, yeah, tell uh, us more about Capulum, because you know. Yeah, my my colleague, um, I mean uh, Maule, Man Manuel Galzerano. Sorry, too much English, so I can't speak <laughs> Italian names. <laughs> Manuel Galzerano. Uh, he published on this um, Capulum, uh, uh, finding uh, um, an argument about the um, the presence of, of Capulum uh, in uh, Lucretius. Uh, by seeing it uh, in the um, in the viral satires, so I didn't quote it. Also, just for a matter of time, uh, and because uh, it's already proven in a way. And um, also, uh, Alessandro Schedaro has, has published um, an article about these uh, references uh, between um, viral satires and Lucretius. I think there are there is much space to investigate, further investigate. Uh, um, uh, the connection between um, these two authors that clearly know each other. And uh, I would like to add uh, just one final thing. It, it is always said that Cicero never mentions uh, um, Lucretius, but also Varro never mentions Lucretius. That's another interesting <laughs> part of the story. Why, why, why they didn't mention him? Never. Even in the, the Lingua Latina, no quotation, I mean, 
uh, whether you like or not, the Epicurean uh, philosophy, Lucretius language was full of uh, elements to, 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 to investigate, to, to quote, or, but of course, Varro uh, was more, um, I would say, um, interested and I had uh, a taste for um, the uh, Annus Plotus, so the, the most ancient um, uh, poets. But it's something also telling that uh, why all this um, oh. silence about of course, issues. <laughs> and it's in the presence of Tim Cornell, so with a, more than a note of hesitation, but both Cicero and Varro are fragmentary authors, after all. We, we, even for them, we don't have the full picture, so there might be uh, some there might be, yeah. Lucretius slanting or, 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 I don't know, or hugging uh, somewhere in, in what's gone lost. You can never rule it out. I'm sorry, very quickly, do, do you have any views on uh, the performance of the Manipian satires? I mean, do you think there is any chance that those texts could, uh, in one way or another, be performed, read out? Or, or, or do you think that that's really sort of bookish stuff that well, the, in, the, in, that form. in some fragments, there, there are some elements of, um, uh, thank you so much, Amy, for, uh, uh, I would say, in some fragments, there, is, uh, there are some uh, clear um, reference to an audience. Uh, so, um, this can be a proof uh, or a piece of proof, I don't know, uh, about the, um, at least the reading aloud, but I'm not sure because uh, Barrow's language and Barrow's way of writing was really complicated. Uh, I think it, it was not complicated just for us. Uh, I think it was complicated also for the Romans. That's my impression. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm, um, but uh, uh, finding and understanding all these puns, all these um, absurd sometimes changing of subject and the um, etymologies coming from other etymologies, uh, quotations, it was really, really complicated. And um, what we know about the, the satires, uh, we can, of course, read uh, what uh, the character Varro said uh, in, the, um, in the second edition of the academics uh, from uh, Cicero. And there uh, um, is saying that uh, he put in this satire a lot of philosophy and mixing it with comedy. And um, uh, I, I, I imagine more a, a sort of a reading audience not really a performative audience, but that is my impression. I don't have any evidence to, to, to prove it, so. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, right, um, are there more questions or, or comments? In which case we should uh, uh, probably uh, bring this to a close. Uh, Irene, thank you very much indeed. For, for such a stimulating uh, talk, uh, really, you really are wonderful. Working on wonderful uh, material, and you so. wonderfully brought out it, its potential and significance. Um, we will be reconvening <clears throat> in uh, uh, two weeks' time, Friday afternoon, with a paper by Imma Eramo on uh, Frontinus and the late Republican civil wars. Till then, um, <clears throat> keep well and stay safe, as they say. Thank you very much, Irene. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.